Greetings, folks. As promised, I wanted to spend a little bit of time and to give you a supplemental lecture on uh, how to use the NGA West 2 ground motion prediction or attenuation relationship spreadsheet. Um, when I first developed this uh, 545 class, I was really torn. You know, part of me wanted to just have you read the papers and then have you make your own tool, your own spreadsheet to, you know, with one of the NGA equations and and I know it would it would have been like a two-week homework assignment and and you know you probably would have learned some stuff and that's great but at the end of the day you, you would have hated me and you would have had one model and chances are the model would probably have had errors in it and so you may not uh, be able to use it in actual practice so instead I took the approach that I wanted to give you a tool that you could actually use that is vetted and validated and that would be useful to you in your career. And uh, I, I do have to acknowledge and, and throw a shout out to my friends at the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, and uh, particularly Dr. Sehan, who um, was a postdoctoral student um, at Peer, and he did his PhD under Professor John Stewart at UCLA, who developed this spreadsheet and shared it with the world. Uh, it is a very powerful spreadsheet. It can use all five of the NGA West to attenuation relationships, and they're all built in here. And it's very user friendly. And so I just wanted to give you kind of a, a tour on how to use this. Now, by no means is this going to remove the you know the pain and the difficulty of climbing the learning curve with using this spreadsheet. But hopefully this little supplemental lecture is going to kind of numb the pain a little bit and, and make it a little easier uh, or maybe speed up that learning process just a little bit. So um, with this being said, I, I want to just give you a quick overview and tour of the spreadsheet. And you can see, I mean, where I'm hovering my mouse, there are numerous worksheets here. Uh, I'm only going to just talk about these three main ones that are highlighted here on the left. All these other ones you can explore and look at yourself. These are all the individual models and their coefficients. And, and you can see really how much work went into the spreadsheet. Okay. But um, here's the main page, and all of your work is going to be done on the main page. It has the input, it has definitions, it has um, tables to check whether or not your data is valid, it has plots, and it has even instructional plots here to make sure that you get your distances correct. The instructions page uh, is useful because what this does is it tells you which models are valid for what. And so you can see, for instance, region codes, depending on what region you're in, um, it will tell you which models yet you can go ahead and confidently use the um, relationships for. Okay, So if you just want to, say, rely on, on global data, for instance, then here you go. If you want to um, utilize, uh, Let's say you're, you're analyzing a site in Italy, you'll probably only want to use um, the ASK14 and maybe the Idris14 model. These other ones um, have ways that you can modify uh, the relationships to make them valid, but we're not going to worry about that in this class. Okay. Um, what if, by the way, your site or region isn't specifically called out over here? Then just assume global and go for it. And this little table here will show you which input parameters are going into which model. So you can know whether or not you, you need to you know, go to the effort to provide an imp a value for these input parameters depending on which of these models you're specifying or selecting in your analysis. Okay. Uh, the model applicability page just shows the limits and the bounds for each of our five NGA models. So you can go and check this out to make sure that you're not interpolating with any of your data. Uh, and in the last lecture, you remember me talking about the IDRIS model. That's the I-14 here. 
and I said it was only good for stiff soil and rock sites and here's where you can see that see VS 30 greater than or equal to 450 meters per second so you know here's where you can go and check and make sure that you're not using these models like uh, in, in ways that you shouldn't all of your work like I said is going to be performed on this main page and there's different ways that uh, we can uh, specify the models to be used okay so let's talk about this upper section up here um, we can specify how we want the averaging of the selected attenuation relationships to be performed whether we want to use the geometric mean or arithmetic mean um, I'm going to go to my trusty whiteboard here so the geometric mean would be like um, you know u bar might be x1 times x2 times x3 times x to the n all to the 1 over n power so that would be a geometric mean geometric means are nice if you have um, some you know one or two or three points out of many that you feel like could really skew the data and so if you want to minimize that effect from a couple of your points use the geometric mean the um, arithmetic mean is the one that you're probably familiar with right that's where it's going to be x1 plus x2 plus x3 all the way plus x to the n all divided by n okay that's the arithmetic mean I'll tell you the one that most professionals use and default to is the geometric mean and that's why I believe is the default on the spreadsheet now these values down here in the cells below these are the weighting values for the five different models and these um, weighting values all have to sum up to equal 1.0 if for whatever reason they don't like what if I add 0 0.5 right here watch what happens oh I get a warning the weight should sum to 1.0 oh okay so maybe I want to do like 0 0.2 all the way across if I had a rock site and see the warning goes away if I do something like that and what if I didn't want to use Idris and Boulanger well then I might make you know 0.25 I might weight all these different models that are valid for my soil site. Uh, I want to weight them equally. The point is that my weights need to add up to 100% or 1. Then I can define how many standard deviations away from the uh, median I'm interested in. Now it's going to give me both. Down here in this table you can see that I have median values and I also have median plus however many standard deviations I specify if I go and I type say 2 check this out see those cells they changed to 2 standard deviations and you see how the plot changed now let's say I want 3 standard deviations away from the median check this out whoa now we're getting really big ground motions or really low ground motions um, depending on what we're interested in so this is where you can specify however many standard deviations away you want and this uh, damping ratio value this is something that's unique and cool to the NGA West 2 attenuation relationships we can specify damping values for something other than 5% now what's neat about this spreadsheet is um, it'll still maintain a 5% damping that, that's kind of our baseline um, right here on the left but whatever damping ratio we define here um, or in this cell right here will be shown on the right so we can get an idea of how our damping is changing our response spectra but I'll just put it back for five percent now okay now um, everything is color coded I'm not going to talk about the color coding because if I did I'd look like an idiot I'm colorblind you can figure out the color coding yourself okay the main thing I want to point out is this color whatever that color is down here that is input 
and those are things values that you need to define so I have moment magnitude I have R RUP as we talked about in the previous lecture RJB right there the bore joiner distance RX and RY not so these are my distances that we talked about before um, if you get confused on the distances come down and check out these figures down here they're, they're going to help you out uh, for instance this one on the bottom right this is a plan view so the eyeball looking straight down on the fault it shows you the different RX and RY distances um, these figures which we showed you in the previous lecture try to explain what RX is and RJB and if you're looking for a more of a formal definition you can come down here to the definition of the parameters and you can see if what you're doing aligns with the actual definition okay so for instance you know RX measured perpendicular to the fault strike right okay let's go through some of our other input parameters and we'll essentially be done. Now we, we talked about VS30 in our previous uh, lecture and here's where we would input that and that's in units of meters per second. Okay, this U value, if I go down to the definition here, this is an unspecified mechanism factor. Now that, I know that sounds hokey, but basically what that means is there's a fault, but I don't want to specify what kind of fault it is. Okay, so if you make that one, that's going to leave it as an unspecified factor and it's going to add additional uncertainty uh, to your analysis. Watch what happens if I change that to one. Okay, it's going to shift my um, standard deviation values a little bit. So we're just going to leave it at zero because we want to define what our fault mechanism is. Um, now this is something that gets students a little bit confused and it really shouldn't I'll explain it to you okay these are your fault mechanism triggers these F R sub V F N sub M and F well, actually I'm sorry just these these two here F R sub V F N sub M the default fault type in the spreadsheet is a strike slip fault now if you want to model ground motions from a reverse fault you're going to enter one for this value and you're going to enter zero for normal fault if you want to model a normal fault ground motion you're going to enter zero for the FR sub V and one for the normal fault trigger and if you want to model ground motions from a strike slip fault you're going to enter zero for both the reverse fault and the normal fault triggers and it will default to the strike slip fault this next input is what is a trigger to define whether or not our site is located on the hanging wall or the foot wall if it's on the foot wall we're going to put zero if it's on the hanging wall I'm going to put one in there and this is kind of fun you know let's go up and just check out the plot here where my arrows hovering and watch what happens when I change this value If I put zero <laughs> it does nothing are you amazed now you can't see it because of the parameters we have in here uh, these specific parameters it's not making an adjustment but if I had different parameters in here um, it would make a difference and you'd see the hanging wall ground motions would be larger one thing I forgot to mention about this R why not you'll notice here on the side there's these little help tips or, or hints that are on the right if your this value has this little unknown thing and say you don't know what R why not is uh, you just you don't know enough about the fault geometry to measure it or estimate it you can just come in and put 999 okay and that is a default value you what you're telling the spreadsheet if you do that is I have no clue so uh, let's just throw this value out you come up with the best estimate and we'll run with that 
Okay, um, here is the dip. This is the dip angle of our fault. So if it's a strike slip fault, it'll probably be close to 90 degrees. If it's a normal fault, it'll probably be something close to 70 or 80 degrees. If it's a, a reverse fault, it might be 45 degrees or less. Um, and so you're going to put the, the angle, the dip angle of the fault. Okay, all these other values that I think that's blue or purple or something like that, these are all calculated variables. Now you can enter site specific values and that will def or trump the um, calculated values that are calculated by the spreadsheet. But you got to understand that spreadsheet does not automatically calculate these values. You have to specify 999 if you want the spreadsheet to calculate it. Okay, this ZTOR, this is the depth to the top of the rupture of the fault. So if I have a hidden or a blind fault, it's going to be the distance from the top of the fault to the ground surface. If my fault daylights, if my fault goes all the way to the ground surface, then that value is going to be zero. Z hype, if we come down and look here, this is the hypocentral depth from the earthquake. So this is the depth from the ground cent the ground surface to the focus or the hypocenter of the earthquake. Man, if you know this, then you're awesome. Uh, most of us are just going to put 999 for that value. Z1.0, this is where um, in these two values here, the Z1.0 and Z2.5 is where we're going to account for basin effects in our attenuation relationships. The Z1.0 is the depth from the ground surface where did you go to where the soil or I'm sorry the rock has a shear wave velocity of one kilometer per second so it's the depth from the ground surface to where the rock has a shear wave velocity of one kilometer or 1,000 meters per second Z 2.5 is the depth from the ground surface to where the rock has a shear wave velocity of 2.5 kilometers per second or 2,500 meters per second. And W, okay, W as you can see right here, this is the width of the rupture. Um, don't confuse that. Look at where my arrow is pointing right here. I'm going to zoom in. Okay, it's the width in the down dip direction not the width along the strike that is labeled L right here W is the width in the down dip direction okay now all these other things um, you know VS 30 whether it's inferred or measured we can uh, indicate that I mean if you're inputting VS 30 and you actually measured it then you want to put measured if you're guessing it then it's inferred. FAS, this is where we have flags whether or not we want to compute an aftershock ground mo motion or a main shock ground motion. Okay, um, So usually we're just going to press no. Um, region, this is where we can say um, you know do we want global or just California data, China data, Italy data, New Zealand. Do we want to just specify which region we're specifically targeting? In this instance, we're just going to say global most of the time. Or if you're in the Western United States, you can use California and you'll be fine. All the rest of these values down here, okay, I would just leave alone. The spreadsheet's going to calculate them. You can um, come and see what they mean over here in the definitions on the right, but don't worry about it. Finally, down here at the bottom, there's this table. This table is going to check the inputs that you provide, and they're going to tell you whether or not you should be worried about it. Um, values that are calculated by the spreadsheet are listed in red. Values that are black are values that you entered or were um, calculated based on input that you provided. So with that, um, all of these values, these tables here, this is as a period uh, down here in seconds. And these values are spectral accelerations corresponding to those periods. So um, for instance, 
given a period and a spectral acceleration uh, from low periods to high periods, that is a response spectrum. If I'm just interested in the peak ground acceleration, okay, that is the spectral acceleration that corresponds to zero seconds or an infinitely stiff single degree of freedom oscillator, and we can get that right there. Okay, I don't know why this says negative one, but I'm not going to change it. Um, this value is the peak ground velocity predicted from these uh, attenuation relationships. So with this, I mean, you should have everything you need to start experimenting and playing with predicting ground motions. This is an extremely powerful spreadsheet, guys. And there is a learning curve, but have fun with it. And um, with this uh, tutorial, I think you'll have uh, an easier time on your homework assignment and hopefully um, will resolve some of your questions that all, almost always seem to pop up every single semester. But don't hesitate to come find me or my TA uh, if you have questions on this stuff. We'll be happy to help you. All right? Happy computing. Have a great day.